On mic today, we have Michael Mueller. How are you doing this fine evening, sir? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Aaron. How about yourself? I am doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to talking to you because I'm a huge fan of independent cinema. I kind of got away from it for a little bit because I couldn't find any projects that interested me. And then yours dropped in my lap, and I'm like, wow, this is taking me back right to the good old days, man. So you've got a movie called The E-Listers? Yes. All right. Life, this, life, life in the back lane. Life in the back lane. And you are, if the movie is about extras in the movie industry, and for somebody who doesn't know what that means, that is the background players, the non-speaking parts, and, and yeah, the grind. Yeah, your, your audience in every sporting event, it's your audience. It's all the people sitting in the restaurant when you see uh, a couple eating or a family eating. It's the 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 mailman walking in the background it's the people in the city walking up and down the street it's all those people are put there with intent and not there by accident so those are the people uh we're highlighting in the film and somebody who hasn't been on the productions of a movie set Mm -hmm. might ask why are you making a movie about these people well there's so there's a class warfare that goes on in their subculture uh, where, you know, honestly, they're, they're, they're really mistreated souls. They're the, they're treated like the third world stepchildren uh, of Hollywood and they're, they're the unwanted, but needed or even required. Could you imagine watching karate kid and there's nobody in the audience when he does the crane kick? And yeah. there's no one there to cheer for. It's just like his mom and his girlfriend and Mr. Miyagi. And, and, and that's it. There's there's it, all of a sudden it kind of loses its epicness. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think especially because we're in such a funky period with just storytelling as a whole, we're we're in. It's like we're in a constant generation of remakes and reboots, and there's not an original idea coming out of mainstream Hollywood. Um, And I think they're out there, and this is a good example of one, because when you – even watching the trailer or the teaser, there's not going to be anything you can really compare it to. No. Uh, There really isn't. And I guess this takes me back to the – early to mid 2000s when independent movies were kind of at the forefront of our attention. And this is, I would say, I would compare it to some of the best of those. I would even put it in the, the realm of, of a Kevin Smith type of movie that has that feel to it. So wow, I'm, wow. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to ladle on the praise, but I'm like, this is something I'm psyched for. And, and for somebody who's not into film, mm-hmm. I might, I, I have to point out what's obvious to you and me is that, when you watch those sporting events or the big wedding in the big church with all the people there, they didn't just find a church full of people who were willing <laughs> to be quiet. No, they, they every one of those people was selected. And people yep. who don't make movies don't realize this. That There was effort to get that crowd there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, they have everything from something like those large scenes, which they call them the cattle calls because mm-hmm. they're really just trying to get butts in seats. And then, you know, they have the more um, like in in a lot of our scenes, it's more handpicked or what they like to call featured core background artists Mm -hmm. um, where where you may have a table uh, in a conference room and there's people that are in the scene. um, They just don't have any lines. They're they're Mm -hmm. background actors. They're they're serving a purpose of whatever it is, the director, the story the director's trying to tell. Um, and Edward Reed, who is the creator, writer, and lead actor in the film, he spent many, many years doing background, and he knows a lot of that circle of people. So <clears throat> when he decided to write the script, he's basically taking um, experiences and stories from set, and there's actually like a whole Facebook group page called Stories from Set, and it's this again another subculture of background artists um and his depiction is very spot on most people that have seen the the trailer or have seen the the extended teaser ha- said it was scarily on point like with the way that is from their experiences it, not being on our set but just in their own experiences we really hit the nail on the head and i think it's because we stayed kind of true to what 
they um, have all went through. So, like, all of those people that are in the film were background or are background at some some point or level. And you would have to have that kind of experience to, to write this kind of movie, to, to feel mm-hmm. it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I think, and I, I think that's why there's such a huge attraction with this cast ensemble. That I mean, I'm really looking forward to seeing some. I, I think there's some really great potential for some of the actors that we've seen in there. Uh, see in the E-listers to have a breakout role. I feel like it's going. It's just my natural gut feeling. I, I feel like it's going to be a cult classic at least within the entertainment industry, because it's something that is so right there in your face if you're on set, but nobody ever hears about it outside of that. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like, it's almost like, I don't know, I don't want to say whistleblowing, but we're we're definitely shining this, this bigger light on things. And I, I think it's giving a voice to the little guy. And um Edward's whole role in the movie, he plays Jack Bersonow, and he's basically the leader of this rebellion against the class warfare that goes on on these sets. And, you know, it, it's just the most asinine stories and things, but these are all things that actually have he's experienced or friends of his, you know, that they've gone through. And, you know, he just put them into a story and put characters to them that were similar to the ones that. Uh, we're in the original or actual story and mm-hmm. it just works man it, it's one of those things that just works you know what i mean yeah now <laughs> let me put it to you this way because you're you're saying you might be quote-unquote whistleblowing or shining a light on the subculture if you went back in a time machine 30 years and shown a light on hackers computer geeks mm-hmm. uh, you know poking around the, and you're like this is not going to appeal to the mainstream audience. Nobody's ever mm-hmm. going to care about what these dweebs are doing on their own time. And mm-hmm. then just five years later, that whole thing blew up. And now there's mm-hmm. a hacker movie every year. This could go in that direction. Well, you know, I was, I was actually, I met with Edward this evening and we just had a, a quick powwow, just prepping for uh, the red carpet next week and everything. And I told him, I said, man, I said, Edward, we, we, we got to get started on part two because there's ultimately, and you'll understand it a little bit more like once you see the, the film in its entirety, when I say there is a universe in this, meaning it could break out into something that's episodic. There could definitely, I, I already pitched in my ideas for, for uh, the sequel because it's, the characters that like at the end of it you feel good about the ending um but you still want more just because mm-hmm. there's so many great characters you 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 want to you want to invest and follow their story it, you become like one of them you become an e-lister through watching it by default like you're an honorary background artist just mm-hmm. by joining up for the adventure you know what i mean and it's a, it was it was probably the most fun I've had on any set uh, in creating something as chaotic. And again, those things will all play itself out when the movie's released. But it was the most insane time I've ever had making anything. And I, I wish I could go back and do it again. Like it was so much fun. Like mm-hmm. it's not fair at some level that someone is that having that much fun at work, you know, but someone's got to do it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I will not push you to give away any details of the movie because I'm sure you want to get to the premiere. You don't want to give any spoilers, but if you could give me some sort of background as to what kind of a, a class warfare are you seeing between different factions of background players? So the so no, and this is public knowledge. So and we just included it in the film. But what I can tell you is that there is. For example, uh, craft services where all the snacks and the beverages and all these things that are uh, there for cast and crew consumption, um, they have a cast, uh, they have a crew crafty for the crew and the, the main cast. And then they have basically a table with cheese balls and a bottles of small water that are on a table for the extras because there's so many of them, they don't get. 
you know, they're just treated differently. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they sit in a room packed like sardines for hours and then they, you know, until they're hurtled into a room to shoot their scene and they get paid basically what it comes down to is usually uh, $64 for eight hours worth of work. And they're human props, and that's how they're treated. They're not treated – they may be treated worse than the actual props that are, you know, <laughs> that are being used in mm -hmm. the film. So everyone kind of and, – and, and you see in the scenes where we have Derek, the PA, who is like a Napoleon dictator, and he's that production assistant that lets any ounce of authority or power go to his head. So, you know, he's put over, there's always a production assistant that's over the, the cat, the extras holding area. And if it's time to go to wardrobe, he, he funnels them in, or if he's got to bring X amount up to set, then he's it. But he just does it in the most dictator Napoleon type way. He's just, you know, he's destined to be great in his head. And that's, that's how he acts. Mm hmm so those are some of the ideas of where it is. And it, it, it's just that they're shoved in the rooms. You know, you got cast, like your, your speaking cast probably gets a nice comfy trailer um, with anything they want or, you know, ask for. And these guys are fighting over cheese balls and bottles of water uh, packed in a room together, you know, and that's kind of like in that, in the teaser, you kind of see us go through, uh, the holding area and what that different, what the different clicks are like. It's almost like back in high school and you go to the lunchroom and everyone's kind of grouped together in their clicks. It's the same thing. It's just different types of clicks, you know, and we kind of cover that. And you tend to think that the clicks will go away when you leave high school. And that's not even close to true. That, it, they get worse mm -hmm. because, you know, in, in high school, it's probably like five clicks, but you walk out into the real world and all of a sudden you realize everything that has like a subculture has its own click. Like, and now it's like, well, like in the, the teaser, we have the, the click of campers, which bring all the, the fancy chairs to set and they have all their supplies to sit there for 16 hours. And then you have the, the click of people who brag about being featured meaning they were just in a shot with a famous person and then you have the weirdos and the creepers and the the retired people there are normal people there that are just there because they're retired and they don't have anything else to do and you get to socialize with people it just it just multiplies I, that's what i found in in my time my 40 years here it's the the clicks don't go away they just get bigger yeah, and I think in some cases, and just to to drag that home, in high school, the only thing that kind of keeps it under control is that you're you everybody realizes they're forced to be in the same building for eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. When you get to the real world, when you get to a movie set, that's something that you're kind. It's a clique you're choosing to be in, and in some cases, people are paying you to be in there. So somehow that pours fi gasoline on that fire. Yeah. So it's it well you know. So I would say there's there is the click of especially in the indie filmmaking world, right? There's the click of all the people that want to make films or tell stories, but then within that you start having like the sound people are a click and then the camera department is a click and then you know your locations people are a click and then the actors are a click like all of a sudden it starts getting broken into these different segments uh which it gets really odd sometimes because it's like i can literally walk on someone else's set i know exactly what roles people are because they're just definitive by a look in the way that they act like i know a gaffer when i see a gaffer i know someone in the camera department i i know when i see a first ac or a second ac it, it's just like they have this uh they just have this aura to them um but at the same time, Aaron, the thing I like to say the most about filmmaking is that it's the greatest team sport on the planet. 
And, you know, people, are, oh, what do you mean a team sport? And I'm like, look, you, you have the most random group of people that come together to tell a story. And the only way this random group of people would ever be in the same place together is for the same goal. Like, you would never catch all those people together otherwise. And it's kind of like if you think about any of the other sports out there, football, baseball, basketball, hockey, um, soccer. Again, you, you, you look at a football player and they all generally have the same build or look or physique and same thing with other sports. But like filmmakers, we're not in like, you know, you, you won't go to a sporting game and watch people dish out 16 hours together to, to get to a common goal and like, you know, stick it out, man. I mean, I've seen more sacrifice, blood, sweat and tears on a movie set than I've seen in any Sunday watching football. That's a good point. Yeah. So there's a lot more. I, I don't want to say more or less dedication. It's just a different type of dedication uh, because, you know, you got those guys out there everybody on the field in, in sports is a millionaire and that's not the case on a movie set. And, and we're putting in longer hours and it's because of the true love and passion for what we do. And I think at the end of the day, even though the people are different and there's the subcultures, everyone still keeps the main goal at hand. And, you know, and that's what happened with the E-Listers. It was 150 people it took to make this film. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And sure. you know how many, you, you know how many different walks of life, are coming through uh, 150 different people from all over to, to make a movie. Do you know the, and that's like Ashley Davidson, my first assistant director did such an amazing job with the scheduling and just the managing of that massive group of people for a seven day shoot, which was another huge victory because 77 pages in seven days. You're you're a film guy. You can't even probably begin to wrap your head no, around. No, I, 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 I'm not even thinking seven days. I mean, that's that's ludicrous that you got <laughs> that much down in seven days. Seven days, 77 pages. 70 pages. How many locations? Um, ultimately it was eight locations, but we holy shit. Yeah. So we, but we flipped some of those to pull off multiple looks to where you, it, so actually when you watch the movie, it will seem more, it will feel like way more than 10 locations, but we were able to double and triple up some of the locations. And that was kind of our thought process in pre-production when we were locking in places that we could pull, um, you know, maybe two or three different scenes out of a location so we didn't have to do a, a, a company move because you know that many people that much we shot a cam and b cam you know 4k so like we just had like this tremendous amount of footage and coverage and it was just easier like we could go to a location and pull everything out of it that we could so but you know again it goes to having a great team like my team ben beeler my dp uh we, we had worked for together for like two years leading up to this project. So we had a really good um, vibe and understanding of I knew how he worked. He knew what from a director standpoint, like my look that I prefer to go or lean towards when it comes to lighting and uh, camera movement and, you know, composition. So those are a lot of the things that attribute to being able to pull something off as insane as we did. And it ha comes to uh, getting your tribe together way in advance. Like don't try and crew up the week of a shoot, like spend your time. Like I host a, I'm a co-host of a, a, of a monthly mixer we do here in Atlanta mm -hmm. where it's just, it's all about uh, production crew and I'm constantly mingling because like, I never know, like, if a guy's going to get sick or he's booked on something. So it's like, I got to keep that circle constantly fresh. And I do the oddest. And I could tell a lot of production people aren't used to being, I come from a, a corporate background. So my interview style is a little bit different. And when I know we got some things in the works and we start crewing up, I host these interviews and they're always thrown off because I don't ask them any skill set questions. It's about 
deciding or figuring out if they're like a decent human being and are they going to be a problem on set or are they going to add to the value of the set so i'm asking a more human interest questions than anything else because i can help fill in the gaps on skill set and i can teach skill set i can't teach you how to be a decent person and i think Mm -hmm. that's the core of where this whole story comes from so you know for me it's important that you know, I don't, me and my team and everybody else doesn't fall into that same stereotype of, well, oh, most directors are a-holes and most, you know, assistant directors are drill sergeants and, you know, this, this and that. Like, because at the end of the day, I I got into this because I, I love to tell stories and I think it's an absolute privilege to be able to get up and do what I do every day. You know what I mean? So, uh-huh. Why would I, why would I want to be an a-hole to someone? Why would I not want to, you know, it's just not necessary. Like the people in it, like, I don't think for some of the people that have been in it for so long, they don't realize like what everyday life is like for everyone else. That's just trying to, you know, make it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, what you just, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I, I was just rambling. <laughs> no, no, no. You're the guest. You're supposed to ramble. I, I just what you're touching on is exactly what this show is about. I don't even think you realized you were walking into that. But the fact <laughs> that people love being creative, they love telling stories. This is this is a huge part of our lives as people who are into this. Right, and right, yet right. there is this myth out there that to do this, you have to be an asshole. Or, or at least a jump and, and to grab – I don't want to talk to somebody who is in that department. I want to talk to somebody like you who mm-hmm. has this great idea and you want to make it using genuinely good people. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, uh, in, in, especially in, in, in filmmaking, I mean it, it does trickle down from the top, right? So mm-hmm. if, if the director is a D-bag and that's how he treats you know, his circle, then that's going to just filter on down. And – you know, going like well, you take the e-listers. How ambitious of a project that is! I know in order for me to accomplish this and succeed at it, because I don't think anybody gets into filmmaking to want to fail or half-ass it, right? Like mm-hmm. I think everybody wants to be a successful filmmaker. The logic for me is, well, if I need everyone to be giving 150 percent, is the second you 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 start talking down on someone or making them feel inadequate do you think they're going to give you 150 percent? like i just i don't i don't understand that that logic that people have that and i think a lot of times it it's when someone's doing it now it's because that's how they were treated when they were coming up and that mm-hmm. it, it's just something that i it's almost hereditary and it's just passing it down because that's how they were treated. So they feel like, okay, this is how we got to treat the new round of people. And you know, that's what my interviews are about. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want ego. I don't want people feeling privileged. I, you know, I try to open a very collaborative and creative space where people feel okay. Providing their two cents. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, I'm going to have my say in the edit room and what the final cut is and all this and that. But like when you're on set, especially for me as a director, like in that environment, we had a crew of 20, 25 people. Uh, Some scenes had 40 actors in them. Like there's a good chance I might not be seeing something that someone else is picking up on Mm -hmm. because I got how many people am I communicating with on set? I'm talking to my sound, my camera, my script supervisor and I got my AD telling me we got to, if we're going to make this shot before lunch, we got to, you know, so there's a very good chance when I'm being pulled in six directions that I might be missing something. And if I'm, I'm okay. If someone says, Hey, I had this idea. What do you think? Like, I'm cool with that. Like, that's what this process is about. And if it's a good idea and I didn't think of it, you know, we'll run it. If we have time, whatever, we can explore it. But you know, there's like this weird thing. Oh, you know, you like people aren't supposed to talk to the director or people aren't supposed, you know, you, you got to go through some type of chain of command. And like, I get it to an extent, but I mean, like, I'm not the Pope or the a director's not the Pope. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? Like, 
they're freaking human. Like, I don't, I don't understand some of the logic or where some of that stuff comes in. Like, you know, people are better. I think everybody just has a different job on set and a director's job is kind of directing the ship to get to the end, you know, and that's really it. But I think the creativity should always be, you know, should be collaborative because, you know, I, 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 it, I just can't see why you wouldn't want to have some input. You don't necessarily have to utilize it, but why not hear what someone's got to say? There's no harm in it. I... There isn't exactly. It's like, okay, yeah, I don't agree with it. So, you know, but I appreciate the feedback. Like there's just, it's sometimes it's just the way we, we communicate. I think that's such a key. Like at the end of the day, if I take that now, I don't know what these people will end up being or doing or having what type of career they're going to have or what the next time we cross paths. But if what, what is it going to do? How is it going to hurt if, if I make that person feel valued and feel like, and they felt like they were heard, what, what does it do? It leaves a a positive impression on working with me. Right. I mean, Uh and, and someone that, you know, they may want to work with in the future. But if I just shut them down, like, eh, a hole to them, what is that going to do? How does that help anybody? And this, like you said, this community, these people talk to each other. If you have a project two, three years down the road and maybe their friends are looking to work with you, it can't hurt you at all for them to say it wasn't a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or, hey, you know, I was on set and... I was working with Michael Mueller and, you know, he, he, he efficiently got his projects done. Like they, they shot in this insane amount of time and the project was still a very high quality and everybody enjoyed the 16 hours a day they were on set. Like it's, it's rare that you hear people that, you know, say that they enjoy being on set for such a long time. Like I was actually, it was such a bittersweet moment when we wrapped on the production because I, I really enjoyed the camaraderie amongst all these people. And it, it, it for me, it felt life changing because I felt like the great, the crazy part, it, Eric, is that this was my first feature that I tackled. And it was the most ambitious project at the same time. So there, there was this enormous pressure to, A, um, you want the respect of all the cast and crew. Because, you know, at this stage, I'm just an unknown filmmaker. Um, and you have to earn that trust for people to listen to that you have a good idea and that your vision is worth listening to. So... You know, there's a lot of underlying pressures for me in it because I, 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 to that point, I haven't tackled a production that big. I mean, you know, the technique and all that stuff is uh, skill set. That's that's there and that part comes out. But the challenge on the big projects like that is managing the people piece and making sure, you know, everything's firing on, on all cylinders. That, that was a challenge. It, I'll be honest. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous and scared and literally first day to set driving to set, I was sick to my stomach because I was like, what on earth did I get myself into? You know, if you weren't like that, I think you were crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I was literally, I mean, my stomach was turning like because i'm like oh gosh like you know there there, there, it's just so much pressure on on it and you know on top of it my production company also handled the production of the film so it was like all my gear all my equipment you know it, it it was it was insane but you know i i think just the growth that i had as a as a filmmaker coming out of that was it just was tremendous because uh, I, I don't, I don't, I think moving forward, I, I don't think I'll have like that nervous feeling anymore because literally everything that really could have pushed the limit and tried it, we really did a great job tackling the stuff and the way everyone came together. Uh, like this, this film, especially here in Atlanta, it's a huge buzz on the indie scene here because 
of how many people from the indie scene were involved with it. It's like, you know, we're working up to try to be the film of the spring for people to, to see. Um, and it really puts a, a, a beacon of light on our community here, just to say that everyone that was in it was, it was all Atlanta based cast and crew. Nobody, you know what I mean? Like that's a big thing here because we have all these Hollywood productions and they're bringing in all the A-list and all this. And it's just like, yeah, our, our people are getting work, but they're not getting the work, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. So this is kind of like, hey, you're, you're not casting anybody for, for lead roles out of our talent pool here. They're still flying the people in from L.A. and New York. They're bringing all their above line uh, DPs, directors like there's no there's no hollywood work for a guy like me you know what i mean like i I don't have a choice but to be independent and that's fine like i'm good with it Mm -hmm. because i i don't want to lose creative control i you know the 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 bigger budgets and all that stuff it's great don't get me wrong um but believe me when i say you giving a lot up to get that bigger budget you you really are and in this day and age, when the when it, the equipment and the will to do this stuff is so democratized, and the tools are right there, no matter where you live, it's not worth the trade off. We want to have voices of the people in Atlanta, the people in Florida, yeah. the people in Canada or Peru who want to make a movie. They can do it, and there's no reason they shouldn't. Well, and I'm glad you brought up the fact about just the gear and things become, you know, because, you know, you look 15, 20 years ago, it just wasn't affordable to, to make or create good indie stuff. Like you still had to have a a decent budget to get the gear or hook up or whatever. But now it, I think we're in a time where what's being exposed is because now you have such a, a level playing field it comes down to who tells the best story. It's not mm-hmm. about I got access to all this equipment and you have a camcorder. No, uh, I feel confident that my film can stand next to or go toe to toe. Like from an audience perspective, it looks good. It it could play on the mm-hmm. TV right following you know anything else, and no one's gonna bat an eye and say, oh that that's that's an indie film. It just looks it, the quality is there. So mm-hmm. now, now it comes down to, and this is going to keep uh, evolving. It's going to come down to who tells the better story because granted right now we're in a world of Marvel universe and that's always going to, that's going to be what the theater experience is probably moving forward. But now there's outlets for people like myself and other hundreds of thousands of indie filmmakers where you know binge watching stuff on streaming services is the new feature film like Mm -hmm. it's where people are going and this is what i and here's here's a mind-blowing thing possibly maybe not for you aaron but i've had conversations recently with uh peers friends family that in the next 10 to 15 years, YouTube or something similar to YouTube will be the standard of how content is consumed. Mm-hmm. It will it will eventually, um, I say, not I don't want to say wipe out Netflix and the other streaming services, but here's the thing. I have a four-year-old and I have a two-year-old. All they want to watch is YouTube. And I have friends with kids that same age. So they are growing up as YouTube kids and they're watching this wide variety of content. So when all of a sudden you take that and multiply it by millions of kids growing up, you you, you could go to the store, you go anywhere. Parents give their kids the iPad or an iPhone and they're, they're watching YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the norm. So it, when when you think about when they grow up to be teenagers, what do you think they're going to go to thing is? They're not going to want to go to streaming. They're, they're growing up on YouTube. That's going to be the norm of what television is. And we can't look at 
the past or what's right in front of us. We have to look at the as content creators, if you want to survive in this game, you, you have to look at what and how a younger generation is consuming content. And that's where you kind of have to shift your 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 attention, right? So and now YouTube's already ahead of the curve. They're starting to create shows and all this stuff that doesn't make sense to us because I'm like, oh well, they're doing original series like Netflix or whatever. But guess what? They're not targeting me and you. YouTube is targeting, they they have more analytics and more. There are there are 300, what is it? It's like 300 million minutes of video. So, something crazy, but 5 billion videos are watched a day on YouTube. And that's not even counting like people that rewatch videos. That's just, mm-hmm. and, and, and the, the amount that's being uploaded, it's leveling the playing field. And you have influencers and all these people that watch YouTube. Like it's, it's, it's creeping up on the bigger networks, just like how Blockbuster slept on Netflix. They, they passed up the opportunities and, and, and now what there, where's Blockbuster now, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's kind of the same thing. Like, I think we're not too far away from traditional advertising and marketing. Uh, I think it's at its end. Like, I don't know how uh, network television and radio and billboards are still charging the the gross amount of uh, money that they're charging these big companies, because at the end of the day, here's the thing is like they're they have their demographic of who's watching, but there's there's no way they're they're controlling it. It's not targeted enough. You have people and groups like YouTube and Facebook that are getting all these analytics and they're like, hey, you know what? I want to target this product to this weird guy in this basement over here. And guess who has all that knowledge? Uh, they have it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing. And I know I'm going off in a rabbit hole, but if yeah. you have, if you, if you have, so you have Amazon, right? Amazon is taking is taking marketing efforts to an where, where it's custom and personalized advertising. You have Amazon Prime Video where you go and they have their series and they have everything else. And guess what? They also know how you shop, how I shop. And what if they can go to a, a huge company um, like Kraft Macaroni and Cheese and say, we're going to offer you this unique advertising platform to where we're only going to push it to potential customers. Like when you can start breaking down analytics and demographics for the companies that are paying for the advertising and then offer customized as to where now it, people on network television, they spend, you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars on a 30 second spot. And it's a crap shoot. It's a shot in the dark. You don't know. How many people are seeing it? How many people are flipping? How many people are just walking away from it? You know what I mean? Like, or DVR or fast forwarding. But guess what? These other platforms that are feeding into like YouTube, if you're watching a YouTube video, they can force you to watch the video if you want to watch the content. You know what I mean? Like there's different measures to it. But here's Mm -hmm. the thing. Like um, you can go on Amazon as a shopper and you can, list your advertising preferences so at least you're getting things that you would be interested in that's going to be more beneficial for not just you but the company that's spending the money to advertise because if i don't ever use a cert like if i don't do dishes i don't really give a shit about soap or dishwasher Mm -hmm. stuff you know what i mean like sure i i think the whole i think the whole thing is going to shift and you're like, oh, Mike, what does that have to do with filmmaking? It has everything to do with filmmaking. It does. Because that, it does. It, it, it all comes down to how do we generate – because at the end of the day, telling stories are great. But if nobody's making the money to just live through the bare necessities, like does it come into – do we get creative – product placement in our films and we get sponsors because based on the audience that way to where the audience doesn't feel like they're being marketed or sold a product you know like these are different things that you know unfortunately 
we have to think of in order, you know, to stay relevant or find ways to get things funded. You know, if you get an audience, people are going to put the advertising money in because at the end of the day, that's what they want. They, they mm-hmm. want to be able to have access to audience. So, you know, if you start looking at different ways to do that, otherwise, you know, you, you got to get, you got to think out of the box. You got to it be innovative when it comes to that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to grab the bull by the horns and say to your people, hit that subscribe button right there, right now. Mm-hmm. Please mm-hmm. do. Please do. Okay. Yeah, and the- okay, but seriously, um, have you ever read Tough Shit by Kevin Smith? No, because I don't read, but that sounds really interesting. Okay. Uh, it was a book, and the thing is, it was printed about 10-ish years ago, nine, nine, ten years ago. My wife mm-hmm. got it for me for Christmas the year it came out. And the thing is, it was before Netflix got really big into streaming. It mm-hmm. was when YouTube was just getting its feet out. Amazon mm-hmm. Prime Video was not even heard by anybody. Thing, And he said in this book that the next big thing, that the next genius idea in film is going to be when somebody figures out how to marry content creation with distribution. Mm-hmm. He said this mm-hmm. almost a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And that was 100%. So when you're saying, what's this got to do with film? That is exactly what it's got to do with film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree 1,000%. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're, uh, we're paying for premium memberships to avoid advertising, right? Mm-hmm. So, and everything now, if it, everything now is subscription-based. If you want to listen, like... I don't even understand why people advertise on the radio anymore. Like who listens to traditional turn your car on radio? Like I don't even understand how any of them are in business. There's a gazillion podcasts out there. There's a podcast for everybody at Mm -hmm. some level. There is Pandora, there's Spotify, there's SoundCloud. There there's a million things other than listening to 30 commercials in a row on a radio to hear the same four songs played over. I, I Like, it's mind-blowing to me that advertisers or companies are still spending their their ads, their ad budget that direction. It just, it it baffles me. So let's let's make sure that we, we get people to watch this movie because, like I said, you've got a big, big week coming up. The premiere is right. coming. Where right. can they see this movie? So uh, if they are local and in Atlanta or the metro Atlanta area, uh, the premiere will be on the 12th at the Midtown Art Cinema in uh, in downtown. And then following uh, on the 13th, Friday the 13th, nonetheless, we will be uh, available for digital purchase or rental on Amazon. And this episode is going to go live very late that Wednesday night on the 11th. So if you're listening to this right away, check it out. Uh, and where can we follow your adventures otherwise after that gets released? Uh, definitely. I have the home base of m3creative.net, which has links to all my social media, my whole portfolio, uh, the, progr- uh, the progress of my studio that we are going to have our grand opening shortly after the premiere um we just got to get to our final inspection which that's a whole nother story but we i it's been in renovation for almost a year i bought a building 2100 square feet last may and we are just now getting to the finish line of uh renovations so that's exciting awesome awesome well michael this has been fantastic i I want to cut you loose so we can make sure we both get stuff taken care of. Yeah. But thanks so much for being here, and I'm really looking forward to this. I, please, anything that you got needs, check out my website, www.aaronbossick.com. All the show notes and links are going to be in there. Yeah. Hey, and Aaron, I would love for you, once you get a chance to watch the film, I, I would love just to get your feedback and just, you know, what you thought of it, um, because those – the, the honest feedback and the, the honesty, it, it just it helps me become a better filmmaker um, because it's my job to try and figure out how to create stuff that an audience wants to see. You know what I mean? So uh, definitely be interested to hear that from you. I will definitely check that out and I will get back to you on that. OK, sounds great. OK, my man, have yourself a good night. OK. All right, man. You too.